For those of you guys that weren't here during the lesson study, we talked a lot about the cross and, and what it has to do. Why was Paul emphasizing this? But Jesse shared a quote that I want him to, to share right now, if he could. The reason why I had him share that is because the title of this message is called The True Heart of the Matter. Yes. Amen. But the question is, the heart of the matter of what? You see, we must understand what our condition is before we can even diagnose or make an attempt to find a cure. So then the question is raised, what is our condition? Any ideas? Wretched. Sinners. Wretched. Poor. Naked. Naked. Mm -hmm. She's quoting Revelation. Mm -hmm. You see, the heart of the problem is the problem with the human heart. In, in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, it says that the heart is deceitful, or the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Matthew 15, verses 18 through 20, it says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These things are they which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. And in Proverbs 4.23, it tells us to keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Frank shared this already, but I'm going to share it again. As I was coming up with this message and as I was studying, I came across this. It says in Christ Object Lessons 159.3, it says, No outward observance can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through to my soul. Amen. You see, our hearts are, are naturally evil. When, when a baby is born, and there's another baby there, that baby automatically cries and wants attention. He wants that, he's, that selfishness. And so our hearts are naturally evil. But as we study, we'll find out that there is hope. So, Let's go to the beginning of the Bible where it all started. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. So now what we're going to do is we're going to break this down verse by verse. So Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. And the word of God reads, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. This is found in the call to stand apart. It says, The promise that Jesus would come as our Savior had been made in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve had first heard it, they expected a quick fulfillment of that promise. And so, when they held their firstborn son, who's their firstborn son? Cain. 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 
When they held their firstborn son in their arms, they both hoped that he would be the redeemer. But we know that that's not the case. Verse 2. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So now let's talk about Abel. The name Abel itself means vapor or breath. In fact, this is important to mention because the same word in Hebrew is hebel. And that word hebel, you'll see a lot throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. And the word that is used there is vanity. So, basically what this is saying is that Abel was nothing but a vapor. Doesn't mean he wasn't important. But his parents didn't think any more of him because they thought Cain was the promised one. Continuing to verse 3, it says, And in the process of that time, it came to pass that Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. You see, I, I thought this was interesting as I was studying this, because then this thought came to my head. But I started thinking about Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve had sinned, what did they use to cover themselves? Jesus. They used the fruit of the ground. The same, the same, how it says that, you know, Cain brought the fruit of the ground. That's what Adam and Eve brought to God when they had sinned. The fruit of the ground. So that's really interesting. Verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the first thing of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel, and to his offering. But unto Cain, and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance had fell. We don't need to go through the whole story of Cain and Abel, because we know what happened. Cain goes, he gets mad, and he kills his brother. But we do, we do need to understand why it's important to, to realize the significance of Cain and Abel. Why is it so important that we do understand it? Because in Patriarchs and Prophets, it says this, So far as birth and religious instruction were concerned, these brothers were equal. They were equal. They both knew everything. Since both were sinners, and both acknowledged the claims of God to reverence and worship. To an outward appearance, their religion was the same up to a certain point. But beyond this, the difference between the two was great. Continuing, these brothers were tested, as Adam had been tested before them, to prove whether they would believe and obey uh, the Word of God. They were acquainted with the provision made for the salvation of men, and they understood the system of offerings which God had ordained. They knew that these offerings were to express faith in the Savior whom the offerings typified, and at the same time to acknowledge their dependence upon uh, their, their risen, their pardon, and to know that, let me read that again, I just got lost, no worries. To acknowledge their dependence on Him for pardon, and they knew that by thus conforming to the divine plan for their redemption, they were given proof of their obedience to the will of God. What this is saying is that Cain knew that he was supposed to bring an animal. So why did he bring fruit? Did he think that his gift was going to be accepted? Did he not truly understand? I mean, we just read how he truly understood, but why would he bring fruit if he knew that a sacrifice was needed? Hebrews 9.22, it says, Without the shedding of the blood, there could be no remission of sin. And we all know that we are all sinners. And there has to be a sacrifice on our behalf because we have sinned. But Cain didn't do that. Continuing, it says, They were to show their faith in the sacrifice. But besides this, the first fruits of the earth were to be presented before the Lord as a thank offering. Cain didn't go to God with his fruits because he wanted God's mercy or pardon. He just brought it to say, I thank you, Lord, and that was it. 
So as you can see, Cain and Abel, they both knew what was supposed to be brought. And they both understood the implications and the significance of the sacrifice. So then, why did Cain get mad when his gift wasn't accepted? Well, if you guys are thinking about that, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Can you think of another story in the Bible where someone tried to justify their actions, that they thought they were doing good, that they thought they were right, when in actuality they weren't? Any ideas? See, I like all these answers. And I like how, yeah, different and random, Old Testament and New Testament. But I want us to go to the New Testament. And go to Luke chapter 18. And in Luke chapter 18, Christ is talking, and he's telling us a parable about such a person. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. And remember, we're trying to figure out what the true heart of the problem is. Okay. Luke chapter 18, and we're starting at verse 9. And the word of God reads, And he spake this parable unto a certain, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, an extortioner, unjust, adulterous, or even as this publican. You see, just like Cain, he gave a, a thank offering. Yet his eyes were blinding him from his true condition. And looking upon others, as he says, I thank God that I'm not like this person. Notice, he talked to the piano, not you guys. <laughs> but he's like, I thank God that I'm not like this person. That he didn't really see the true condition of his own heart. Continuing. He says, I fast twice in the week and I give tithes of all that I possess. So then he goes and he starts bragging about all the good work that he's doing. Question, is there anything wrong with fasting or giving tithe? No, right? In fact, like it's something that God requires of us, that he wants us to do. But, he says, when you fast, Jesus Christ says this, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites who go and make it known to others, for I tell you that they have their reward. And then, he, when he's talking about tithes, it says God loves a cheerful giver, not a boastful giver. You see, these, both of these works, tithes and fasting, are, are wonderful in themselves, but done with the wrong spirit, and it becomes glory of self and not glory of God. Continuing, verse 13. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, the publican, however, he realized that he was a sinner, and that he was in need of God's mercy, which is why he said, be merciful to me, a sinner. And even though he, he couldn't look up. He would not dare to look up because he was a sinner. He still went to God. Verse 14 says this. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. And he that humbled himself shall be exalted. You see, even though this man's head was down, God lifted him up. And go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, because this is pertaining to that. First 
First Peter chapter five verse six, and it says, and uh, all the youth should know this. You just did this memory verse last week. It says, "Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time." See, we're called to humble ourselves. And the reason why is because it helps us to realize our need, our significance, our dependence upon Christ. But when we don't humble ourselves, we put our trust in ourselves, then we kind of set ourselves up for failure. In Second Selected Messages, it says this, Mark you, it was a self-righteous Pharisee who was not in a position of humility and reverence before God, but standing in his haughty self-sufficiency, he told the Lord all his good deeds. So that's like, you know, we do an evangelistic series, and, and I, I preach the whole series, and then like, I'm, after the series is over, I'm like, yeah, I baptized like 10 people. Like, did I baptize them? I may have did the action, but did I really baptize them? Did I make them make that decision? No, they chose that themselves because God was working with them. And that's what this guy didn't realize, the, the, the tax collector or the Pharisee, he didn't realize that. And he, he comes in with this boastful, this haughty spirit. I imagine the statue in Daniel like this. You know? That's, that's how he came <clears throat> bringing his name. And uh, that's why we need to humble ourselves. And remember how I was talking about Cain and Abel? It says the Pharisee and the publican, they represent two great classes into which those who come to worship God are divided. The first two representatives are found in the first two children that were born into the world. Cain, he thought of himself righteous, and he came to God with just the thank offering only. But Abel, Abel came with the blood that pointed to the Lamb of God. He came as a sinner, confessing himself lost, his only hope was in the unmerited love of God. The sense of need, the recognition of poverty and sin, is the very first condition of acceptance with God. Where the Bible reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3. And you see, as, as we study the life of, of Cain and Abel, or the Pharisee and the tax collector, it helps us to realize, how are we looking at others? Should we be looking at others? Or I should be focused on Christ. <coughs> Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And if we're not following the example that Christ set us, we are indeed uh, the term used is you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're setting yourself up for failure because you're looking on faulty human beings. I'm no different than any of you guys. I'm a sinner who is in need of God's mercy just as much as you are. But to, to elevate or to raise someone to this pedestal saying that, oh, because he's a pastor or an elder or a deacon, like, you, you right there, you're in danger of putting someone in danger of themselves because you're making their head get bigger that doesn't change the significance that we are all sinners regardless of what title is attached to you so we've talked about Adam I mean we talked about Cain and Abel and the condition of Cain and where his heart was coming from it wasn't coming from a heart that was Built with a sense of appreciation of God's mercy and, and His grace, but was thankful that He can give whatever He pleased, um, you know, and He thought it'd be accepted. And we talked about in the parable how Christ was talking about there are some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous in themselves. We see that our righteousness is as filthy rags. That doesn't change. We need the righteousness of Christ. 
And so as we studied those two, now we have to look at ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says, Examine yourselves, know ye of yourselves, know ye not that ye are of Christ, except ye be proved a reprobate. And a reprobate is, it's an unprincipled person, it's um, someone who, who does basically whatever they desire. And has no regard for the Word of God or spiritual things. And uh, none of us here are reprobates, are we? I pray that we aren't. Were. We were. We were. We were. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3 to find out our condition. Because this is still a problem, is it not? Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Right there, that's the... That's Jesus Christ telling us that he sees all the good works we've done, and he knows all the works that we've done. But yet he said that I will spew thee out. Why? Well, let's continue reading. It says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. You see, this is our true condition. This is where the heart of the matter lies. If we can't see in ourselves that we are sinners and that we need Christ's mercy, there's a problem. And then we tell ourselves a lie, we believe that lie. And God allows us to believe it because we're not making a decided effort to change. We say, yes, we'll wait on God's timing. And, and yeah, that's good to wait on God's timing. But is God going to force you to do anything? No, he wants you guys to make that personal decided effort to surrender, like Jesse shared in that quote, to surrender your heart to God. There's this quote right here, and this is found also in Christ's object lesson, page 116.3. And it says this, we were talking about salvation yesterday at the Bible study. If you guys get a chance, I would encourage you to be there. Um, it was a huge turnout and it was a huge blessing. But let's, let's read. It says, Salvation is a free gift, but yet it is to be bought and sold. In the market of which divine mercy has the management, the precious pearl is represented as being bought without money and without a price. In this market, all may obtain the goods of heaven. The treasury of the jewels of the truth is open to all. So you guys will need a membership. It's open to all. But it says, Behold, I have set thee before an open door. The Lord declares that no man can shut it. No sword guards the way through this door. Voices from within and at the door say, Come. The Savior's voice earnestly, earnestly and lovingly invites us. And then, this right here is titled, The Cure. He gives us the cure. In verse 18, it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. 
to anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that you may be able to see. You know, go to Ezekiel 36, verses 25. Twenty-seven. Ezekiel, what? Ezekiel twenty uh, thirty-six. 36. Okay. Thank you. No problem. And if you get there before me, have mercy upon me. Okay, so Ezekiel thirty-six twenty-five. Through 27. And hear what the word of the Lord says. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. You see, as soon as we accept the cure in Revelation, 8, uh, Revelation 3 verse 18, that the moment we accept that, that God starts working in our lives, He starts working on our hearts, starts changing it for the better. But we have to allow Him to continue to change it. To remove those things. You know what causes heart attacks? Blood clots. Blood clots that get in the way. Or plaque buildup inside that blocks the blood from flowing properly. And when those things get in there and it blocks off the circulation of the blood. The flow of the blood. Your heart's not receiving what it needs. And it starts going into a panic mode. And then you end up having a heart attack. Well, I want a heart attack, but not in the sense of a painful one like that. But I do want a heart attack to where God can attack the evilness with inside my heart. And that can change it from within so that the outward appearance will be seen. That Christ has definitely worked on my heart. And that he's still working on my heart. I'm not perfect. I'm still a growing process just as much as you guys are. But the point of this is this. We know now what our condition is. And we know what the cure is. The question is, what must we do? How can we be saved from our evil and deceitful hearts? I'm asking you guys that. What can we do? I want to read the quote that I shared with you in the beginning. Let's go back to Christ's object lesson 159. It says, You're right. We can't do anything. It says, No man can empty himself of self. But then it goes on to say, We can only consent for Christ to accomplish this work. We give Christ the approval to work in our lives, and then Christ starts working in our lives. And then it says, the language of our soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. Our last verse is found in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 19. And this is a powerful verse. One, because it talks about what we must do to prevent that. But it also talks about the significance of... So, I think it was last week, I'm not sure what week. But Jesse was talking to this girl named uh, Lizzie. And uh, Lizzie had asked the question, what makes Adventists different than any other denomination? And I think this verse will help Jesse and will help us all to understand what it truly means to be an Adventist. Well, let's go to 1 Chronicles 22, verse 19. 
and the word of God reads, and this is the instructions. It says, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. So that's the first step, that we have to give our hearts to God, that we have to make our hearts set towards God. And we get so excited, so anxious when uh, it's something that we truly want. Like for those of you that don't have a driver's license, like how bad do you want it, you know? And that's something that you're striving for. So when you finally get it, like your heart rejoices, right? It's the same thing right here. We gotta set our hearts, that anticipation, that excitement towards Christ. Then it goes on to say, Arise therefore, and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God. The sanctuary isn't going to build itself. We have to do the parts where we can put a, a guard around it so that nothing can break in. We have to put doors so that only what we allow in can go in. But part of the sanctuary is this, that before the priests would bring that person to go cleanse them of their sin, that they had to repent of everything that they did. Anything that was holding them, all the transgressions that they had upon them, had to be forgiven before they could even make the sacrifice. They had to make sure that they were pure of all infirmities before they could do this. And likewise, so do we. It says, Build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God. And it doesn't stop there. Then it tells us the Bible study. How are you saying it says Bible study? Well, it says to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God. What's found in the sanctuary? You have the altar of sacrifice. You have the labor. You have the table of showbread. You have the seven branch candlestick. You have the altar of incense. You have the mercy seat, which is, it holds the Ark of the Covenant. What's in the Ark of the Covenant? God's law, the bowl of manna, and Aaron's rod. Why are all these significant? Because these all help us right here as we grow in our walk. That table of showbread wasn't just to eat. It symbolizes the word of God and that we need to be reading daily. That altar of incense is prayer. We gotta be praying, asking God to work on us, to change us, to help us, to whatever our situation is. And that seven lamp candlestick, that's your outward profession of faith. That's what people see Christ in you. When they look at you, do they see Christ? This is something that we need to be asking ourselves. Are we reflecting Christ more and more daily? But it doesn't stop there. The altar of sacrifice, we got to be dying daily to self. If we're not doing this, as we continue to go on in our path, that we'll continue to strengthen wrongful habits, which will ultimately lead us to our downfall. And the, the, the labor, the symbol of baptism, we got to be baptized daily by the Holy Spirit. Not just by water, but by, by air and fire. You know, we need this, all these things. And this is why it's so important to understand specifically this verse, because that's what makes Adventists different than any other denomination. The understanding of the sanctuary message. If we don't have this understanding, how can we go and, and, and tell other people that they need Christ? 